Clark. Ben Clark is a Clean Transportation Emissions Analyst with the DC Climate Action Secretariat. His main role is coordinating the Community Energy and Emissions Inventory. Mary Storzer is a Senior Planner with the Ministry of Community, Sport, and Cultural Development. Since joining the provincial government, Mary has worked on numerous projects to support sustainability planning in BC. These include smart planning for communities, green community performance measures, and community scale GHG and energy modeling. Mary has been with the Ministry of CSC since December 2006. Michael Wallenitz is our third presenter, and he is developing a publicly available and user-friendly community energy and emissions forecasting model. Michael works with two Vancouver-based energy consulting firms, MK Dockard and Associates, and Navius Research. And then our last presenter is Dale Littlejohn, and he's the executive director of the nonprofit Community Energy Association. Dale designed and, designs and oversees delivery of the DC Hydro CEEP Quick Start Program. I'll pass it back to Darby to go over the poll score of the day. Great, thanks very much. And, and this is also our, our agenda for, for the day. See in front of us, so starting with Ben, Michael, and, and Dale. So, and again, we, we will uh, be um, uh, trying to make time for some questions between each of the presentations. So I would just like to remind you that at any time, you can use that Q&A button at the top of your screen to pose your questions, and we strongly encourage you to do so. So we do have some poll questions for you to, to start off. So I'll just put those up in front of you. So here they are. Here's the question. Have you or your local government used the 2007 Community Energy and Emissions Reports since they were posted in the spring of 2010? So please, uh, um, you're welcome to, to vote on this for your particular situation. And I will post these so that you can see them as well, show the results to you. There you should now be able to see the results. And we seem to be consistent, fairly consistent there. That, and we're just going to take a, a record of these. Raise it up a little bit there. Okay. okay, great, thank you. And we do have one more question for you. So who has been the users of the reports? Um, so local government council board, local government staff members, consultants, or all of the above? And we realize there might be a little challenge here if, uh, if you're two of the, of the three of the choices there, but uh, please do your best with the selections that we have there. Again, I'll show you the results of this. I'm going to take down the numbers for these. Okay, great. Thanks very much. And yeah, turn it over to Ben. There was our poll question and our graphic. <laughs> great. Thanks, Darby. So, hi everybody. I'm Ben Clark. I'm going to speak briefly about the Community Energy and Emissions Inventory, where it's currently at. And then I'll pass it over to Mary Storzer, who's going to talk about what to expect from the CEI in the future and some other related initiatives. So, the CEI was started in 2007 as a need was identified for a cost-effective way for local governments to report and track their energy consumption and GHG emissions. This common system available to all local governments allows staff to focus their resources on setting GHG reduction targets and related policies and actions. And worth noting that this was the first such initiative in North America at either the state or provincial level. So why use CEI? There's three key ways that a local government can use the CEI. First of all, 180 local governments in BC have made a voluntary commitment to the Climate Action Charter. The second of these three commitments is to report community-wide greenhouse gas emissions. A second way local governments can use the CEI is to help fulfill their legislative requirement under the Local Government Green Communities Statutes Amendment Act, also known as Bill 27. This requires municipalities and regional districts to include GHG reduction targets in their respective official community plans and regional growth strategies. And finally, 
Municipality, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Partners in Climate Protection Program, currently has 67 members in BC. Milestone one of their five milestone process is to complete the GHG inventory and <laughs> So at this point, I just want to spend a moment clarifying the difference between a corporate inventory and a community-wide inventory. DEI as a community-wide inventory is much broader than a local government corporate inventory, as it is designed to include all of the emissions produced within the boundaries of a community, while a corporate inventory is designed to include only those emissions produced from traditional services directly under the control of the local government, such as civic buildings and fleets. And the first commitment under the Climate Action Charter is to become carbon neutral in corporate operations by 2012. Corporate operations typically include only about 1 to 4 percent of the overall community-wide emissions, but taking leadership is an important step towards achieving those broader reductions. Great. So the CEI reports are produced for all municipalities and regional districts in BC. Reports are also generated specifically for the unincorporated areas of a regional district, as well as for the Island Trust, a unique federation of local governments. The CEI reports are comprised of three main sectors and three memo items. The main sectors include energy use and resulting GHG emissions that are somewhat under the policy control of local governments. And the reports also include memo items that are location-specific to those local governments, but fall more within the control of other senior levels of government. And included as well are a set of supporting indicators that help to provide context on the rest of the figures, and Mary will speak a bit more about this shortly. So, as many of you know, the baseline 2007 reports were released nearly two years ago, and we are currently putting together follow-up reports for 2010. Reports will be will continue to be produced on a two-year cycle for 2012, 2014, and so on. And because continuous improvement is an important part of the CEI, we are constantly looking for feedback on how to improve the content and design of the reports as we move forward. So the 2010 reports. What you can expect to see in the upcoming 2010 reports, we are going to release the reports in tabular Excel format, first of all, and then follow up with a bit more detail in PDF reports later on. Each of the three primary sectors have undergone slight improvements to the methodology, most of which is focused on improving matching of data to the proper locations. It's also important to note that the 2007 figures are being reproduced with the updated methodologies so that temporal comparisons can be as accurate as possible. I won't go into any further detail here, as everything will be explained in the guidance document that will accompany the reports when they're released. And now I'm going to talk about an exciting side project that's happening that will allow access to the CEI data in a bit of a different way. So because all of the CEI data is linked to a specific location, we're working with GOVC to allow users to explore the data visually and spatially in a map-based format. All of the current data in the 2007 reports, as well as the new 2010 data, will be available in a variety of spatial formats. And this includes a web-based mapping tool, iMapBC, where users can view layers of the CEI data along with a wealth of other data that is in the BC Geographic Warehouse. And the data will also be available for download to use with Google Earth and other geographic information systems. We expect this to follow closely on the release of the 2010 reports in the spring. So, now I'll pass it over to Mary. Thanks, Ben. Um, so, what I wanted to talk to you about is some of the work we've been working on for actually quite a while to help us improve the CEI reports going into the future. So, specifically, what you can, uh, what we expect you'll be able to see in the 2012 reports. So, there's three major sort of um, components, I guess, that you'll, you'll see. The first is an improvement to the buildings data. We've been working on a project, or we've been working on this, I should say, through a project called the Tandem Project, which um, some of you may have heard that acronym. Um, and the intent of that project basically is to align data um, 
building data categories amongst the data providers that, that, are, that we have, so BC assessment data categories with BC Hydro, with Fortis BC, et cetera, et cetera, and as well to align those with NRCAN's models um, energy data categories. Um, the second intent of that project is to enable reporting at the neighborhood level. That's something we'd heard from, from you that you'd like to see as an improvement. And so as a result, in the 2012 reports, we are hoping that we will be able to produce for you um, buildings data in two uh, different ways. One is at the major category, building category level at the neighborhood scale. So by major building categories, at this point, I mean residential, commercial, institutional, and industrial. And neighborhood scale is currently being, we're currently looking at census boundaries to, to define that, both tract and dissemination area, as well as looking at neighborhood planning boundaries that are, that are currently being used by local governments where known. Um, and then the second way we hope to be able to provide it to you is at the subcategory level, at the community scale. So a bit of a larger uh, geographic scale, but then the finer grain in the actual categories. And what I mean when I say subcategory is, for example, within the commercial um, sector, you might see information on uh, buildings that are retail strip, buildings that are big box, buildings that are other retail, et cetera, et cetera, and, and the list goes on. Now, privacy is our main constraint here, the, the issues related to... And so... Um, we will, that, that's what we're working within, but what we're trying to get is a little bit, bit finer uh, uh, grain detail for you uh, in two different ways. The second improvement that you'll see for the 2012 reports, and by that I mean the 2012 reports, those that will be coming out in 2013, uh, not the 2010 reports that are coming out in 2012, um, <clears throat> is that we will have the updated data from the 2011 Census of Agriculture data. Uh, in addition, the third thing that you will see in there is this round of the 2010 reports that are about to be released will not see supporting indicators included. Uh, the reasons for that basically it was delayed in order for us to be able to include um, census uh, uh, information, uh, 2011 census information, and as, a, uh, as well, to enable us to actually formalize our data collection procedures and align reporting years, because some of the data, for those of you that are familiar with the supporting indicators, you saw 2009 data on supporting indicators in the 2007 reports. So we want to be able to try, we're trying to sort of formalize it so that it's going to be more useful and more uh, streamlined and, and, and sort of a consistency that you can expect out of that. So you will be seeing in the 2012 reports updates to the 2007 indicators that we provided, so you see them there, housing type, commute to work, et cetera, et cetera. And as well, we're working on data for new indicators to be included, being proximity to transit, building energy intensity, and that goes back to the work we've been doing to join, like I was saying, BC assessment data with energy data as well, and uh, floor space, waste diversion, and a mixed use of proximity to services indicator. I think that's all I want to say there. Um, oh, there's still work underway. We have additional supporting indicators, and we're, we haven't lost sight of those. We're working on those. And uh, now I want to uh, hand it over to Michael and Dale, who are going to take you through how they have used the CEEI data in the tools and processes that they have been developing to assist local governments in greenhouse gas reduction um, and energy consumption reduction. But first, I think maybe we would take questions at this point. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. And I do encourage strongly uh, our attendees to uh, put their questions in in that Q&A up at the top there, and, and we can address those, and, and we do have one there now. And that question is, when you say 2012 reports, do you mean the 2010 data uh, released in 2012 or 2012 data released in the future? So I tried to say that, work that into my my uh, dialogue there, uh, but basically, yes, so what, what I was talking about was 2012 12 reports, i.e., that will be coming out in 2013, reporting on the 2012 year, as opposed to what you're about to see, which is 2010 reports in 2012, which sort of goes back to my, my rationale around the supporting indicators in terms of trying to formalize and align our processes in order to limit the confusion. Great. Thanks very much. And as we don't see any other questions there at this time, perhaps we'll, we'll move along. And again, I, I will encourage you to 
please put in your questions up top there. So, um, Michael, we'll turn it to you. Michael, if you could unmute your uh, your line, and I'm putting the camera over to you now. Okay, I believe I've taken the mute off. Great, we can hear you. Excellent. Okay. Uh, my name is Michael Wallenitz, and I'm here to talk to you about a project I've been involved with that's made use of the uh, community energy and emissions inventory data. Uh, that project is the SIMS Community Energy and Emissions Model. Uh, an overview of this project is uh, the model is an energy and greenhouse gas emissions forecasting tool. Uh, and you can use that for a quantitative analysis as a part of the community energy and emissions planning process. The design of this model uh, has it as a, as a user-friendly and free-to-use um, program so that it can be used by local government, uh, alleviating budget and time constraints associated with energy and emissions planning. <clears throat> As well, we've designed it to have a, a very quick setup that allows experimentation with a variety of different assumptions uh, in order to facilitate ongoing analysis and planning. The development of this project has been a collaboration between um, two consulting firms, MK Jackard and Associates, uh, as well as Navius Research, uh, the Energy Materials Research Group at Simon Fraser University, and it was funded by uh, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. As well, we've had uh, the support and input of members of the Sunshine Coast Regional District and the Regional District of Nanaimo. Now, I will briefly explain what the SIMS model is. Now, first of all, the, the name SIMS was once an acronym um, several decades ago that now no longer made sense. At this point, SIMS is just a proper name for the modeling framework. And what this modeling framework does is forecasts the energy and emissions of a region from the present out to 2050 in five-year increments. So we can track how the energy consumption and emissions are developing through time. Uh, I provided a, a schematic showing a very basic portrayal of what the model does. On the assumption side, we need to tell the model what the energy price is, as well as sector activity we are assuming. And uh, as an example of sector activity, that could be the number of households and the amount of residential floor space that uh, requires energy for heating or appliances or what have you. Uh, or alternatively, it could be the amount of uh, personal transportation, so how much people need to get around. This gets fed into the model, which has uh, certain model characteristics that make it useful for forecasting energy and emissions. These include a, a detailed representation of the technologies as well as sectors uh, that result in energy consumption and emissions. <clears throat> and this model is able to simulate the policy impact on the choice of technologies that people are using as they replace their uh, worn out. So if you, say, buy a new fridge because your old one is broken, what kind of fridge do you buy? If you're getting a new car because you've gotten rid of your old one, what kind of car are you getting? And it also shows the impact on technology use. So, for example, how much heating is needed, and that's a factor of the kind of homes you're living in, the size of homes, uh, the number of shared walls and the uh, energy efficiency of the building shell. So these are the model characteristics that we're simulating. The results that come out of that are, as I said, a forecast of greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption. <clears throat> now, to understand how this might fit in with community energy and emissions, um, I, I, I like to think of these uh, factors, the energy and emissions associated with community, um, being driven by three interrelated components. Uh, the first is the demand for energy services. So this relates to things like economic growth, population growth, uh, as well as the, the choices and technologies um, at play within the community. Uh, the other component is, of course, the technologies. So specifically, what are people using to provide their energy services? How are they getting around? How are they heating their homes and so on? And last, uh, the energy and emissions of community also depend on urban forms. So this is uh, the structure of the community, how things relate to each other spatially. Now, to show where SIMS fits into this, um, it is a, a specialist in simulating what kind of technologies people use within the region and 
what kind of demand for energy services. So both of those are simulated results um, as well as based on a certain uh, assumption of activity within each sector. So how many houses are there? How many commercial buildings are there? How much travel do people need? The third component isn't directly covered by SIMS. This would be urban form. However, you can use SIMS to explore the implications of changes to urban form relative to the other drivers. Now, the question is, how can SIMS help at the community level? Um, it can facilitate community energy and emissions planning by answering a number of questions. For example, what would greenhouse gas, gas emissions be uh, if we do nothing? Uh, what would be the impact of provincial policy on these emissions? What would be the impact of local policy? Is there overlap or interaction between different policies? And given the existing technologies and infrastructure, basically, uh, since we have our buildings and our cars and whole communities full of things that consume energy right now, how fast can we change? Furthermore, SIMS facilitates ongoing planning. Uh, letting us answer questions such as what if the fundamental assumptions change? You know, what if we want to explore a different uh, population forecast or we assume energy prices may be completely different from the earlier assumptions? It lets us answer targets uh, such as what if emissions targets change? What if we want a more stringent or more relaxed target? And what if we change the strength and timing of the policies that are help us, helping us meet these uh, emissions targets? Now, unfortunately, uh, previous to this project, SIMS was a very complicated and not user-friendly program. So what we've done throughout this project is take that SIMS functionality and distill it into a user-friendly tool uh, to forecast energy and emissions. Now, this tool covers emissions from residential and commercial buildings, personal and freight transportation, as well as solid waste. As I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the model is designed for a quick setup. It uses the community energy and emissions inventories. And with a click of a few buttons in a couple minutes, it can be automatically set to represent any given community covered by those inventories. It then forecasts um, energy and emissions driven by user inputs. And as I said, it's very easy to test new assumptions. It's simply entering a new forecast for, say, population or population growth. Uh, allowing to see what the effect of that is, or on the other hand, it could be energy consumption or any number of other user-defined assumptions. And then it allows the user to test the effect of several different policies, and it's very quick to experiment with different policy packages. Results from the SIMS community model include things such as energy consumption. For example, here we're seeing it by residential end use. Uh, we're seeing energy consumption for a uh, theoretical community with a growing population in the residential sector broken down by appliances, space heating, water heating, and lighting. Similarly, we can also look at greenhouse gas emissions, and the example I've chosen here is broken down by the sectors covered by the SIMS community model. Again, we're seeing emissions from residential buildings, commercial buildings, personal transportation, freight transportation, and solid waste. And again, because these results are driven both by assumptions of how the community is growing, energy prices, as well as the technologies used within that community, you can see that uh, you don't necessarily get linear trends. Uh, a good example of this, for example, <clears throat> is uh, emissions from personal transportation declining over time as cars become more efficient and uh, energy prices become higher than they historically have been. Lastly, on the uh, results side, we're also able to show technology-specific data. And the example I've pulled out here are the uh, share of residential buildings um, divided by their vintage, so how old they are and what kind of building shells. So we can see old houses, essentially uh, pre-1963 to 2000, uh, post-2000 standard construction, and as time goes on, we start to see a larger adoption of higher efficiency homes and even high efficiency or near net zero homes. Again, these are not assumed results, but they're simulated results based on the input into the model. Now, I'll just take a moment and talk about the uh, design of the model and highlight some of the features that we are striving for throughout the project. Um, we wanted to create a model that's complex enough to be useful. So, in other words, it creates a uh, realistic portrayal of energy use and emissions in a community and how policies can affect these. And yet, we wanted it to be simple enough for anyone to use. 
And uh, most importantly, the, the whole point of the project is to create a model and documentation that are free to use. So this can be picked up by anybody, uh, anyone in local governments especially, and used for a variety of purposes, such as a standalone analysis, used as a comparison to a previous analysis, used as a source of assumptions for some other kind of analysis, or potentially even as an education tool because it's a very interactive model. You can quickly see the effect of a variety of different assumptions and uh, planning designs. <clears throat> now, I just want to take a moment and link this back to the, the Community Energy and Emissions Inventory, which is the, the focus of this webinar. So these inventories provide a standard data set to the model. The model contains all of the inventories that exist which means it can automatically represent any chosen community covered by those inventories with a click of a button and a couple of minutes for calibration. So in short, having these community energy and emissions inventories makes it possible to create a simple, useful, and free-to-use model. So this is the end of the um, presentation. I'm just going to touch on the next step is to uh, do as I'm doing right now, inform local governments and other people in the public and provide access to the tool. Right now, we're nearing completion of its development, just working out some of the bugs and how it operates. In future, um, we're hoping from this project to learn about the potential for in-house tools, that being analytical tools, quantitative tools that, uh, quote unquote, non-experts can use. In other words, you don't need to constantly be going to consultants to explore the energy economy system or energy and emissions in your community. Um, ultimately, we hope to apply this learning to the, the platform we've created. Um, we've created a model that uh, can be used by anyone, and as we get a better understanding of what people's needs are and what they want out of such a model, we hope to have an opportunity to go back through and continually improve what we've done. And lastly, um, hopefully this will expand the scope of user-friendly tools. Um, as we see how this is uh, successful or not successful, we may um, increase our, our knowledge of, of how we can provide analytical tools to, to people in local government. <clears throat> and lastly, if you would like, oops, back up one, any uh, updates or have questions on this project, please feel free to contact me. I've got my contact information below, uh, as well as uh, in uh, the brief two-page description of the project that's uh, contained in the uh, the handouts with this webinar. Uh, so, Darby, I'm all done. Um, I guess we can have questions, or I'll pass it back to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Michael. And, and indeed, it must have been a concise uh, presentation, as, as we don't seem to have any questions just at this point. So I, I would, again, encourage our uh, attendees to use that Q&A button at the top of on the toolbar on the top. Oh, okay, great. People are jumping to it now. So some quick typers. Um, okay. Um, Ron actually does have a question, so um, and he's raised his hand. So what I'm actually going to do is, is unmute the lines. I'm going to take the uh, session off uh, off lecture mode. So please, uh, attendees, if, if you could all just mute your lines now so we don't have any feedback. So if you could please hit star six, mute your line, and uh, hopefully we won't have any feedback. Oh, yeah, I see actually Ron has actually typed in something here. Is the model is the model I should say available for distribution, Michael? Um. Uh, it's not ready just yet. We have a, a one sector demonstration model I can hand out. Uh, as I was saying, we've got the the full model just about ready, but it's it's full of bugs that make it crash and and foul up. I don't want to put that upon anyone yet, but. Um, you contact me, I can let you know as soon as it is ready, and we'll be uh, passing the model and its documentation out to anyone that wants to use it. Okay, great, thanks. And we do have a couple more questions here, um, and we seem to have time for it now. So um, another question from Ann Matthewson. What was the time frame in developing this model? When did its development start? And is this the first time local governments have been advised of its details? This uh, model was um, initially conceived uh, about a year ago and development started in earnest last spring. Um, this is the first very, um, I'd say, large-scale um, discussion of the model. 
so yeah, I would say this is the first time local governments have been advised of it uh, in its in its details. Um, as I said, we were working with members of the Sunshine Coast Regional District and the Nanaimo Regional District. Uh, they were providing support, answering my questions, uh, helping me get the local government perspective on, on a number of issues that I was encountering. Um, but we didn't want to open the development process up too large just to try and keep the process tractable. Great. We are getting quite a few questions here coming up. Um, the next one here we have from Allison. And, okay, so I had to step out, so may have missed it. Oh, uh, that uh, question may have been taken away from us. Oh, <laughs> maybe that question was answered. And now the bounced around a little bit on me here. So that was the time frame. So over to Donna's question. Um, question for a previous speaker. Will the new inventories for regional districts be separated by electoral areas? Yeah, I can, I can answer that. Basically, for each regional district, we produce a report that includes the, the entire emissions for the whole regional district and a separate report that is the electoral areas summed together in what we call unincorporated areas. So we do not produce individual electoral areas reports at this time. Um, all of the electoral areas are wrapped up into one separate report. And essentially, you have your regional district report, any member municipality reports, and what's left over is the unincorporated areas. Thank you. And we do have two more questions here. And we are certainly still saving time for Dale yet. Um, who has funded the development and maintenance of this model? So we received funding from the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions to develop this model. Um, the maintenance into the future, that, that remains open. And the initial question to, to answer is, is this going to be useful to people? Um, that's what we're hoping to find out in the next uh, little while. And assuming it is useful, we'll, we'll have to come up with some kind of a business model or funding model that will we'll keep it out there. Um, that being said, um, I'm quite excited by the work we've done. So to, to a certain extent, uh, this thing is, is going to be uh, taken care of by myself and some of my colleagues. Um, but hopefully if we're, if we're looking at significant improvements or changes to the model and it's something that there is a demand for, um, we'll be looking for, for ways of funding ongoing maintenance. Thanks very much, Michael. And I think that last question there is actually in regards to Dale, who's, who's next up. So perhaps we'll we'll turn things over to Dale. Thanks again, Michael. Dale, if you could unmute uh, unmute your line and. Uh... Thanks, Darby. And uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Please go ahead. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I'm Dale Oljohn, Executive Director of the Community Energy Association, and I'll be talking today about. BC Hydro's Community Energy and Emission Planning Quick Start Program and how that's leveraging the CEI data. And the CEI data really makes something like this possible um, because the program is designed to go into small communities, communities under 20,000, in a very rapid, cost-effective way. You get a very practical, in fact, relentlessly practical uh, approach to reducing energy and emissions across the community. And we're able to do this rapidly because we built the tools that take in the CEI data and also have the, uh, the specific actions that local governments can take to reduce energy and emissions currently. And I should note that th this is one approach to modeling. Uh, you, you've heard from Mike about another uh, approach uh, for, for the larger communities particularly as well as for ones that want to go into more depth in modeling analysis. There's other models out there. Uh, Ron McDonald from Stantec is doing great work in this, as is Alex Boston from uh, from Golder, and uh, and there's some other folks out there too. I'd also uh, recommend that if you do have uh, um, uh, you know, interest uh, in, in in this, to watch out for some uh, overviews of the models that are. Uh, that are coming out, and I think Mary, uh, Mary Storzer and uh, Ted Sheldon are uh, continuing to uh, to work on that, as well as pulling the modeling community together in uh, in BC. So thanks to uh, all those folks for the uh, BC Hydro C Quick Start pro 
process. This, again, is a free process for local governments, funded 100% by BC Hydro, because Hydro recognizes that local governments in BC have a uh, GHG, a uh, legal requirement of GHG reductions uh, goals in their OCPs and regional growth strategies, and it also recognizes that uh, fuel switching to uh, electric baseboard heaters is a really, really bad thing, and would like to uh, help ensure that electricity is part of the energy and emissions conversation as well. So the process is actually pretty straightforward for local governments. You can go onto the website, sign up, uh, arrange a date for a uh, call and a uh, webinar, and make sure that we've got a webinar before a uh, full-day workshop with the local government to ensure that uh, everybody is prepared and that's as productive as possible. And uh, we also try to uh, ensure that there's some council representation at the workshop so that as staff move this forward, uh, there, there is some uh, uh, some uh, interest at the council uh, level and some understanding there as well to, again, help focus uh, things on the implementation. So as I mentioned, we come into this with two key tools. One is community energy and emissions inventory for the local government. That tells us where you're at currently. And we also come in with our community energy and emissions actions guide. There's about 40 or so specific actions that a local government can take today within its current powers to influence energy and emissions across the community. That includes buildings and urban form and transportation, it's fiscal initiatives, it's policy and regulatory, and it's uh, uh, social things as well. Uh, so we describe each of those and provide approaches to estimating what you might be able to get out of those. So very much focused on what a local government can do. So we come in, again, like I said, with CEI. We've also pulled in population uh, numbers from BC stats. Those form a basis for the uh, future projections. Uh, we base the business as usual projections on where you're currently at, the CEI population growth rate, assuming that more people means generally more emissions, assuming that you continue to grow as you have in the past. And we also uh, look at the impact of provincial and federal policy. And that, that's where you do see a, uh, a significant decrease over the uh, short to medium term in transportation emissions because of low carbon fuel standard and tailpipe emission standards. We also bring in some very specific process and facilitation techniques to move you through this. What we ask for local governments to provide is the GHG targets that they've already developed, as well as to take a look at the uh, population projection numbers and uh, adjust those to ensure that they align with, uh, with what they're uh, currently using. Uh, we also ask for any previous studies or any local knowledge. So the, the green down here on the bottom of the slide shows what we come into the workshop with. The baseline, the business as usual projection, year by year, fuel by fuel, by sector, up to 2050. The gap between that and the targets uh, as well. We also estimate the overall community-wide energy spending. Now, this is often somewhere between $2,000 and $4,000 per person in a community. This re represents a significant uh, economic development opportunity if you can cause some savings in that and cause some of that uh, money to be recirculated within the community. Uh, based on this, we can also identify some of the top measures that might be applicable for the unique circumstances of a particular local government. Uh, we, we've done this in high growth communities, in urban areas, in small communities along highways. We've done it in communities that have a, a lot of seasonal uh, population and that. <laughs> and we do see that the content is really quite different, particularly uh, in communities that are growing fast versus those that aren't growing. If you're not uh, you're growing significantly, then a lot of the urban form uh, things that you can do that can often provide a big, uh, big influence on emissions long term, really uh, you, you only have so much to work with there if you don't have new development. Uh, so what comes out of the end of a very collaborative workshop is a practical project plan with actions by year, who's going to do it, and some of the key steps for some of the actions. 
uh, a draft community energy and emission plan and uh, capacity and epiphanies. I'll get into those uh, a little bit uh, a little bit more in a slide or two. So this is an example of a high-level overview um, with a fair bit of detail in there that we bring into the workshop. So a one-page snapshot of where things are currently at. Uh, this snapshot was uh, was actually for the uh, the village of Alert Bay, and we've got a low growth uh, rate, about 0.1% uh, annually. Uh, we're seeing about $3,000 in annual energy spend per person. So again, a community of, uh, you know, without a huge, uh, a huge population, spending about one point, a little bit under 1.5 million a year on energy. Down towards the bottom, we see the business as usual uh, line. You see a decrease mainly because of the impact of the provincial and federal uh, policies. And we've got the green line, which is the targets, and the gap that we spend the rest of the day looking at. We also have a pie chart of the uh, energy spend in a community, and this is fairly typical of a lot of small communities with the majority of the energy spend and energy use being on transportation fuels. So <clears throat> we've done this in a number of communities, and I apologize for a typo on the slide under the uh, multi-community pilot. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be sick news. It should be uh, Invermere, along with uh, Kimberly and Golden that uh, we got together in the East Kootenai as uh, part of the pilot. Uh, we've also done the pilot in Esquimalt, Burns Lake, Cowichan Tribes, and Peachland. Uh, we're, we've, developed, we've delivered the full program recently in uh, in a number of communities. We've got a few more coming up, and uh, just yesterday I heard that I think uh, Lytton is signing up as well, and I understand that there might be a couple of communities in CRD looking at this uh, as well. So <clears throat> we're proving this uh, across a variety of communities, uh, all smaller communities, all under 20,000, but in very, very different circumstances, you know, whether it's resort communities or in, you know, ones that are more industrial, uh, ones that are growing fast versus uh, either not growing or shrinking. And across these, a few, few key lessons have emerged. Fo a focus on practical actions. Uh, we've actually delivered this program in communities that already have a, a community energy mission plan, but staff weren't able to, uh, you know, identify very specific tactical actions to do, uh, like this quarter. Uh, to meet the targets in that because it was so high level. So what we've done is we've come in with this process and developed very specific work plan for four years around what actions are going to happen, uh, who's responsible for them, and if we have capacity. We also try to focus on the what more than the why because as we go through BC, uh, there's still a good number of folks on uh, on councils and uh, and in other positions that perhaps don't uh, believe in climate change or uh, have other uh, have other interests, uh, we find if we're able to move beyond that discussion to what are you actually going to do, a lot of that resistance fades away because a lot of these actions just make a lot of sense to begin with in terms of livability, in terms of uh, saving the community money, and in terms of uh, just better quality of life overall. The other thing that we're seeing is it's important to work the math behind some of these actions. So I have an action, but uh, in the afternoon of the, uh, the full day workshop, we try to unpack uh, at least three or four specific actions, uh, going through a very structured, logical process around estimating what the impacts could be. And that really helps make it real for people and also helps identify areas where Perhaps we thought there was going to be a lot more impact than there actually is. Um, so that, that's a couple of the key learnings that we've uh, that we've uncovered going through this, as well as the fact that CEI is absolutely critical for doing something like this, because that allows us to go in with an inventory already there, and when, and when we have the 2010 and 2007 CEIs together, that provides a uh, a nice uh, trend line that we can use along with historical data on population growth 
to fine tune some of the uh, business as usual assumptions. So what does it feel like and look like? Well, up in the uh, top left, we have a number of the uh, documents that we bring in, uh, the one-page overview, the quick start guide, the CEI. We always have uh, CEI printouts uh, available during the workshop, as well as some of the municipal zoning and some specific opportunities from BC Hydro. We go through this by a very collaborative process. Uh, breakout groups with facilitators from, C from CEA and DC Hydro, and this is really a workshop. This isn't about presentations. This is roll up our sleeves and let's figure out what we're doing. Uh, ultimately, it comes comes into a work plan where we where we collaboratively put together what actions we want to have in which years on a board that everybody can see and that we can uh, adjust as we see. Uh, uh, resourcing constraints and things like that. A lot of this is based on the unique character of a particular community. This photo is from Armstrong, where we did a community energy and emission plan quick start, and it's a photo of a pellet plant uh, kind of across the street from City Hall. So there's some unique opportunities that emerge uh, that become very local very quick. Um, we have an example here of working through some of the math where it's a facilitated exercise using a uh, flip chart uh, to help uh, uh, staff and elected officials uh, work through the math uh, process and that structured thinking process so that they're better able to make decisions and projections going forward. So what, what do we end up out of uh, the day with? Uh, so I, uh, the, the main deliverable from that workshop that we co-create is a work plan and uh, you see years going across the top, uh, reasonable balance across the years, some, <clears throat> some actions that are unique to the community that are filled in, so we don't come in just with uh, pre-printed uh, pre cards. We also have some that you uh, fill in, as well as the actions that you're not going to do, because not all actions are appropriate for all communities. So we, we help facilitate that process. We put this into the model. Uh, typically um, either at lunch of the first day or overnight. And from that pops out uh, your emission projections, so your business as usual, which we saw before, the plan or the uh, targets, and then a new line in the middle, which is the plan. Now, it's important to note that you don't necessarily, the first time you go through this, you don't necessarily have to have a full plan to get you all the way to 2050, given that we're only in, in 2010. Um, you know, when you come out of high school, you don't necessarily need a plan to, uh, for every year to hit a specific target when you're 70. Uh, so similarly with community energy and mission planning, uh, you need a plan for the next few years to get started, to put you on the right trajectory, and then revisiting this on an ongoing basis. Uh, so we've got GHG emissions as well as per capita emissions uh, by sector and by fuel, as, uh, uh, by sector and by fuel. Uh, in, a, in a variety of areas, both business as usual and the, uh, the plan, so we can see what the differences are. We also look at it by uh, GHGs by action as well, because BC Hydro is funding at kilowatt hours by action, so electricity savings. And <clears throat> we also look at financial savings. The financial projections are uh, are challenging because I don't know exactly what mobility fuels are going to cost in uh, 10, or 20, 10 or 20 years, but my guess is they're going to cost more than they do today. Uh, so we expose the assumptions that we've got. We allow the local governments to adjust those in a very easy way, and we, uh, we have a projection on the current cost based on some assumptions that can be changed, the 2020 business as usual energy cost, and the energy cost based on actions in the plan. So what we're seeing with this one is $5 million in uh, savings across the community within eight years. So that's $5 million is, is saved every year uh, after the eight years, and there might be some economic development potential too. So a lot of what, a lot of the actions don't just make a lot of sense for climate and energy they also make a lot of financial sense too. Now, one of the things that uh, one of the communities did, Armstrong, they took the 
draft community energy and emission plan that we developed for them and uh, re refine that and actually put it in as an amendment to their OCP. So they embedded some of the specific actions coming out of that day into their OCP uh, as a statement of, uh, as a fair, fairly strong statement of where they want to go. And <clears throat> that's, this slide is zooming in a little bit more on some of the specific things there. Uh, so this is one option. Uh, other communities have uh, simply adopted a community energy and emission plan and referenced it in the OCP. Others like Armstrong are actually uh, implementing it in their OCP, which provides staff with something to go back to uh, with uh, current councils or future councils when uh, when they want to execute on these activities. So again, my name is Dale Liljong, Community Energy Association. Uh, we're a nonprofit society made up of a small number of members such as uh, Union of BC Municipalities, TIBC, uh, BC Hydro, Fortis, um, and uh, about 10 local governments. So uh, thanks for the time, and uh, with that, I guess I'll open it up to questions. Thanks very much, Dale. Maybe I'll just uh, pipe in here quickly just to uh, get some of us pointed towards the right tools here for the, uh, the question period. I'll just bring it uh, over, to, over to me here, the video. Um, so, yeah, we would actually like to open things up to a, a discussion at, at this point. So uh, what I'll do is point your attention back to the feedback indicator in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Um, you have the ability there, um, if you didn't catch it off the top, to just change the indicator from green to uh, purple, which is a uh, question, and the questions will queue up there. Um, you can also use the, the Q&A box, and, uh, as, as we have been doing, so I see a few there already. So you have two avenues to, to ask questions. We are dependent on you to, if we are to open this up to discussion, to, to mute your lines. So if you could all do that now, please mute your lines at star six to unmute your line, and please don't put your phone on hold as well. And uh, yeah, you're, if you just queue up there, um, I'll just ask you individually to unmute your line um, as you come up in the queue there. So we'll uh, we'll try this now. Um, I'm going to take it off lecture mode, and hopefully uh, we'll have clear lines. Just a moment here. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Great. Great. So far, so good here. <laughs> so we do have a, a couple questions that uh, are queued up here, and I'll try and take them in order. Um, and it asked a question here, and I believe it's for Dale. Um, and here's the question, Dale. Hydro is not a large emitter for our community. Natural gas is because we are a northern community. Does Fortis have a similar program? Um, <clears throat> you're, you're right. Natural gas is, uh, the, prim is the primary uh, you know, fossil fuel as well as propane in a, in a lot of small communities. And this program addresses all energy sources, not just hydroelectric. So we look at uh, electricity, natural gas, propane, wood, uh, home heating oil, as well as the transportation fuels, both uh, commercial and, uh, and personal, looking at both personal transportation within community as well as inter-community. So BC Hydro is funding it to ensure that electricity isn't lost in this conversation. Um, and uh, so this is available to all communities in BC Hydro service territory, and uh, we're, uh, uh, we're talking with uh, Fortis uh, BC Electric about uh, something similar in their territory. Thanks, Dale. And uh, I do see Marlene's uh, question there, but uh, we just had two more in, queued up in the Q&A section, so I'll go to them next here. So the next question is, um, how does CEP work for regional districts? It seems that it might be more direct towards specific community as opposed to unincorporated rural areas. Um. It has, uh, the program has been designed primarily to look at uh, municipalities. Um, BC Hydro has, uh, uh, actually just as of uh, last week with some conversations with them, agreed that uh, we can deliver this to regional districts, primarily for unincorporated areas. Given that it runs on CEEI, um, 
it's easy for us to do to look at all the unincorporated areas within a regional district at the same time. If we want to split them out, uh, we can uh, we can discuss that with the specific regional district around what level of precision you want uh, in that, uh, because for for a number of them, uh, it may be appropriate just to uh, take take a look at the total uh, of the electoral areas and then divide based on population with some adjustments based on local knowledge uh, to get that base data, and then we can work through the, the workshop process uh, like we uh, like we do with municipalities. And just the last uh, question before I turn back over to opening up the lines here. So what resources models are available for communities that are larger than 20K? We are 24,000. Dep depending on um, you know your relationship with hydro, you may you know you're, you're close to twenty thousand, so so you, you might uh, talk to your uh, hydro cam to uh, uh, see what they might be able to do uh, regarding this program or co-funding for others. Uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, private sector uh, uh, firms that uh, <coughs> do do a lot of planning for the larger communities, such as. Uh, Stantec and Golder, uh, to some degree, Sustainability Solutions Group uh, as well. So there's a variety of others out there. I don't know, Mary. Do you want to? Uh, I was just uh, going to go in. We were, we were supposed to have one more slide on resources. I'm not sure. If there, there, okay, there you go. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that, um, like Dale has has said about um, some of us at the province here working to try to help um, local governments have access to these tools, and there are quite a few out there. If you just look at the second um, resource there, scale energy and emissions modeling, what we're doing right now is um, on that site, you'll find a number of case studies of, their, of uh, some of the models that, are, that, that have been around for a bit, and Dale's touched on a few of the people, and in fact, a few of the people are actually on the line right now. Um, that, that, have, that work with communities that have, have these models. Um, and so I would encourage you to go check out that site. Um, also, Ted Sheldon, uh, Ministry of Environment, has been working really hard and, um, and us assisting him in, in that, in putting together an inventory of the known tools that are out there, basically, in BC, working in BC and helping local governments. Um, and that should be available very shortly. Uh, right now, um, you know, we, we don't have an inventory as such, but the intent there is to tell you a little bit high level, give you an overview of what the various tools are available to you to, uh, uh, in, in BC. And that would cover all, all, all scale, all, uh, all populations, et cetera. So check out the site now, and there's even more information coming down the pipe. I guess that's, that's my, my main message. Just one more uh, comment on that, kind of linking it back to CEI. Uh, the I'm not aware of models uh, that are being used in BC that aren't running on CEI. I believe uh, most of the, uh, most if not all of the models take CEI in as an input in one form or another. Uh, a lot of them take uh, a, a wide variety of things in to calibrate, but uh, I, I think uh, I think CEI is really assisting in the development of the modeling sector here in BC. Great. Thanks very much, Dale. I'm going to turn it over now to, uh, to actually the phone lines and ask uh, Marlene. Marlene, uh, I see you've actually indicated your question in two minutes, but would you like to hit star six and ask your question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my question is, because um, the Squad was part of the pilot project, but I was just wondering if the quick, the quick start model will be updated or how quickly it will be updated to reflect the 2010 CEI data. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question, Marlene. We haven't been uh, making some adjustments to uh, to the model over uh, over the last year or so since uh, since we did the uh, very first pilot of this in uh, in Esquimalt, and uh, it was great to see the leadership that Esquimalt uh, took uh, by being first in that. Um, we will be updating the uh, the model probably within uh, within a few weeks after we receive the uh, final Excel format from uh, uh, from Ben, 
uh, for the uh, for the 2010 CEIs and the updated 2007 CEIs, and I can get that out to all the uh, Quick Start alumni, uh, as it were. We're also uh, considering the possibility of maybe some uh, Quick Start alumni gathering to uh, share experiences and uh, and that as well. Thanks, Dale. And perhaps now I'll give a chance for Ted Sheldon, if, if he wishes to uh, unmute his line and ask his question. Ted, are you there? Oh, hello, Dale. Or, um, oh, sorry, Dale. Just a sec. Uh, uh, Darby, you can hear me. I can. Go ahead, Ted. No, I've lost my question in the uh, in the ether there, but nonetheless, just uh, Dale, just maybe. The clarification, if, um, if if anyone on the line is not yet familiar with the CARIB reports, if you could just speak very briefly to them. And then, Dale, in, uh, you made reference to it in your workshops, just a, a, a bit of an insight as to how you use uh, that background information uh, for a CEP Quickster. Uh, thanks for the question, Ted. And uh, the CARIB reports, uh, those are the annual reports that all the local governments that are signed on to the Climate Action Charter that are trying to get their carbon tax refunded uh, fill out. Uh, CARIP is Climate Action Revenue Incentive Program, and that's effectively the, the refund of the carbon tax that municipalities have paid uh, over the course of the year. So there's a number of elements of reporting in that, including uh, what a municipality has done to reduce energy and emissions in its own operations as well as community-wide. One element of looking at where a community is and where it's going is what's already been done. So we're able, to be, uh, you know, because this reporting has already been done, it provides an initial starting point for identifying some of the actions that that community has already taken to, uh, you know, shift the trajectory to reduce energy and emissions. And we see virtually all communities doing something in that area. Now, obviously, that's. Uh, that's updated based on staff input and things like that uh, as we move in to, uh, towards the uh, workshops and that. But having looked at uh, the, the compilation of these reports, it's really impressive the momentum that's still happening out there at the local government level around uh, climate and energy. There's still a lot going on, and uh, I think a lot that uh, that can be shared out there. And, and I would just add to that, also on the resources page, we wanted to draw your attention to, to the list. Um, our ministry has put together um, both summary lists of actions taken, uh, as well as highlights, as well as searchable X in an Excel format uh, list of both the corporate and community-wide actions. And you can actually search those actions by community size, I believe, um, as well as uh, you know, various types of actions, categories of actions, um, and uh, like I said, the distinction between the corporate actions and the community-wide. So I think it's a really interesting and, and, and could be very, um, uh, if no one, if you haven't, if you weren't aware of it and if you um, take a read through, it's quite inspiring and I think it can, can um, help people really get a sense of what their colleagues are doing across the province and then thus maybe give another spin on, oh, maybe we could try that or, oh, I should phone them and see how's that working, is that, how does that, uh, you know, how do we get started, that kind of thing. So that's one of the main intents of those reports and those lists is that you can go and search them. Thanks, Mary, and thanks, Dale. Chris K. Chris K. I see you have your your virtual hand raised. Would you uh, like to unmute your line, star six, and ask your question? Thanks. It's uh, it's Chris here. Um, basically, I was just wondering if Mary could expand a little bit on the uh, data that will be used from the 2011 Census of Agriculture um, that they're going to use to improve the 2012 CEI report. Oh, well, I'll have a very low voice because I'm going to pass it over to Ben. <laughs> um, thanks. So, um, what was what was included in the 2007 CEI reports was a measure of enteric fermentation. Okay. What what's being looked at uh, for potential inclusion in the next round is um, soils and manure management. So we're not sure exactly um, sort of what level of data we're going to get from the agricultural census next next round, but uh, th those were two other pieces of information that were identified as uh, 
having the potential to be included in CI reports in the future. So at the very least, still, there will be enteric fermentation once again and possibly uh, manure management and soils as well. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, Chris. And we do have another uh, written uh, question here. Um, and this question is from Ann Page. Follow up on regional district question. Does the 20,000 population limit apply to the whole regional district or just to the unincorporated areas? Our regional district is more than 20,000, but unincorporated areas are altogether equal less than 20,000. Um, yeah, that, that sounds uh, that generally reasonable. Uh, I mean, given that if we did it at the RD level, it would just be for the, reg for the unincorporated areas. Uh, because we uh, do uh, uh, quick starts for the yeah, for the municipalities uh, themselves, and, or we could even gather a number of them together. Um, I, I think uh, probably the regional district conversation is one best uh, to follow up offline uh, with myself and uh, and Hydro around uh, how how we uh, might be able to make that happen. Thanks, Dale. And another question we have uh, written. Um, will these presentations be available for download afterwards? Um, yes, they will. They're actually available right uh, right now. Um, if you weren't uh, participating off the top, in the top right-hand corner of the toolbar, there is an icon up there that looks like three pieces of paper next to the, the camera icon. And if you hover over it, it should uh, come up as as saying handout. Just click on that, and it should uh, bring up a, a box, and you just check mark the, the box next to the document you want and uh, and you're able to download it there. So I strongly encourage uh, all the attendees uh, to do that uh, to do that now that the slides, the slides that you're looking at are there, um, as well as uh, some documents that Ben has, as well as uh, a piece that uh, Michael also spoke to as well. We do have another question here. It's is Dale's presentation available as a handout or as a video recording? Um, so, as I said, it, it's uh, it is available as a presentation here. Um, I should have also mentioned that we are uh, recording um, this session today, and we will be making this uh, this webinar available on the Rural BC website as well as the Climate Action Toolkit uh, the government site um, does record the, the webinars as, as well. Um, so there will be two places that you'll, you'll be able to access it. I will be sending out an email uh, advising uh, all the attendees that registered um, once that is available, once we do get that up on the net. And it will also include the, the supplementary materials and the slides as well. Okay. So that does uh, tackle the, the questions that we, we do have. Are there any other questions? An open call to questions now. Did you want to uh, pose any of the questions we have on the screen at all, or? Sure thing. So, um, just in the theme of, of continuous improvement uh, for the CEI reports, we're looking at, as I mentioned, following up the, the just the raw data in the Excel format with with another set of PDF reports, and it's also going to be the geo visualization, the web mapping tool. So. But it's really, really important to us that um, we're making this data available in, in I guess, a format in a manner that the local government staff can then use. So we're always looking for feedback, and if anybody has any ideas of how you think the data in the CEI reports can be most effectively presented and communicated in the future, um, we'd love to hear either right now or after the fact.
yeah, and just again, an open call for questions. And we are just getting a little bit of feedback on the line. If you uh, aren't uh, posing a question, if you could just mute your line, star six, please. Well, perhaps we'll just do another 30 seconds here for a last call for a question. And uh, if we don't get anything, we'll, we'll wrap things up. Well, thank you. Um, thank you to uh, all of our attendees as well as our presenters. Thanks very much for helping us. Uh, along with uh, developing the webinars as well. Um, these are the resources that uh, we can see a bit during the presentation. So these are certainly available here. And as, as I said, um, you, you can download these slides in the handout section here. I recommend you do so. And also I'll be putting out an email later on pointing you towards uh, the Rural BC website and, and uh, where these documents, as well as the recording and supplementary materials, will exist on, on the web. So if you've registered, um, you will receive that email. Also, um, we do have the contact information for our different presenters who have kindly uh, made themselves available for your questions. If you have any additional ones or think of any after the webinar. Um, and finally, I would just uh, strongly encourage uh, all our attendees uh, to please uh, respond to the survey that we'll be putting out. Um, you should be getting that in just, uh, just a few more days. And it, your feedback uh, really helps us uh, develop these, these webinars, makes uh, both the content and the, the technical features that much better and that uh, more, hopefully, rewarding an experience for us all. So um, with that, thanks, uh, thanks again to everyone.